Hello everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 26, The Third Reich, Part 12, The Night of the Long Knives. This week, a big thank you goes out to Ahmed and Victor for their donation to the podcast through PayPal, and to Dimitri for supporting this podcast on Patreon. You can get access to ad-free versions of all of these episodes, plus special Patreon-only episodes released every month, over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. After the Nazi party came to power in Germany, and after they removed all of their political rivals, they still had a problem, and this problem was far closer to home. Much like Mussolini in Italy, once Hitler finally achieved his goal of leading the nation, he had to find a way to bring those who had helped him to get there under control. There were two main problems that Hitler and the Nazi political leaders faced at this point. First, the SA was a paramilitary group built around the idea that violence was necessary to achieve change within society. They were revolutionaries, radical revolutionaries, and up until 1933, the Nazi leaders had valued them because of that fact. But now that the new regime was firmly in place, they no longer wanted a revolutionary force, like the SA, to be, well, re revolutionary. However, that revolutionary spirit was not just something that could be switched off on a whim, and as change did not occur as quickly as many SA members hoped, they began to agitate for greater change. The second problem was that there had always been a faction within the SA, led by Ernst Röhm, the leader of the SA, that believed that the destiny of the organization was to replace the German army. Part of this second problem related to the first, because many within the SA felt that the military would always seek to maintain the status quo. The tensions between the political leaders of the party on one side and the paramilitary leaders on the other dated all the way back to the founding of the party and was exacerbated when Hitler decided to pursue the political path to power in 1925. Throughout the spring and summer of 1933, Hitler was able to keep the coalition together. He still needed the assistance of those paramilitary groups to enact some of the societal changes that the regime wanted. But as Nazi control over the political organs of the state solidified throughout the summer months, the challenges of balancing both sides was growing. The party could not have both all of the political power at the national and state level, and also have this group of radical paramilitary members that were out on the streets committing acts of violence like they were during the 1920s. This became particularly problematic when that violence was committed against foreign citizens, or even diplomats, and their families. There was also mounting pressure from the industrialists and the aristocracy for Hitler to get his house under control. As early as March 1933, Hitler would try to give the SA an order to calm down, but there was some resistance. There was a general belief that Hitler was just saying that for appearances, and of course did not actually mean it. Now this was the inevitable outcome of the previous years of the Nazi party, where Hitler would often say things for public consumption, but would then make it clear in private that he actually felt something very different. We discussed a great example of this last episode, with Hitler publicly downplaying the Jewish boycott, then clearly supporting it in private conversations. This obviously set a precedent for the SA not actually following what Hitler said in public. All of these problems and concerns would reach their breaking point in 1934, in an event that would come to be known as the Night of the Long Knives. Much like the Reichstag fire, there are many things that we do not know for certain about this event. We do not know exactly when the decision was made to move against the SA. We do not know if the claims made by the government that the SA was in the planning stages of an overthrow of the new regime were genuine or if they were totally fabricated. We also have big gaps of information about what was happening on the side of the SA due to the destruction of so many documents by the government. These ambiguities are important to state up front because, like previous confrontations with the SA, the Night of the Long Knives was partially, and perhaps primarily, a propaganda action. To remove any doubt about who was in control of Germany, and to prove to many within Germany that the Nazi party had everything under control. Discontent within the SA started right at the top, with the leader of the group, Ernst Röhm. Now, no one could deny the importance of the SA, which under Rome's leadership had helped the Nazis in their rise to power. But in the months after Hitler had been installed as chancellor, Rome grew concerned that the seizure of power by the Nazi party had not led to a wider revolution within Germany. Core to Rome's belief was that there had to be a second revolution, 
The first revolution in his mind had ended with the installation of the Nazi-led government and the destruction of the left as a political and cultural force. However, this was not the desired end state, and instead there had to be another revolution, this time one against the traditional German conservative and nationalist parties and their supporters. That meant that the target would be the industrialists, the aristocracy, the old Prussian Junkers, and the army. Through this second revolution, Rome believed that, after already completing the political revolution, the party would finally be able to achieve its wide-ranging goals of a radical social revolution in Germany. Rome was in some ways one of the few Nazi leaders who still hung on to that anti-capitalist message that had been such a core part of the party in its early days. Hitler and others had drifted from this anti-capitalist approach over the years, and instead had built connections with German industry and the existing German economic leaders. Hitler hoped to continue to lean on these connections and to use them to benefit his plans, but Rome wanted to destroy them. Hitler would make it clear that this was not to be considered in a meeting of the assembled leadership of the SA and the SS in July 1933. At that meeting he would say, quote, the revolution is over and that revolution is, quote, not a permanent condition, and must not be allowed to develop into one. One must guide the liberated stream of the revolution into a secure bed of evolution. The education of the people is therefore the most important consideration. The current state of affairs must be improved, and the people must be educated in the national socialist conception of the state, end quote. Hitler would even go so far as to dismiss some party members who he felt were not towing the party line. While Rome and others were calling back to perhaps an earlier Nazi party platform, Hitler was trying to make it clear that the party would go in the direction that he wanted, and he was not in any way tied to existing party programs or party promises. Rome's message was powerful within the SA because many of its members felt at best forgotten and at worst outright betrayed by what was happening. The old fighters had in their mind done so much for the party but now they felt that they had been passed over by new arrivals and opportunists. New party members were given official positions within the party and state administrations, while long-standing SA members were left jobless. They felt that they had been promised a revolution, that should they achieve victory, would bring with it the spoils of victory. But they were instead forced to continue to take unemployment, to live in SA barracks, all while feelings of betrayal just fermented within the units. In their mind, they had, by their own sacrifices, brought the party through its period of greatest struggle, and now they wanted to experience the benefits of that toil. Now, there was some truth in all of this, of course, that the SA had been a tool used by the Nazi leaders to achieve their goals, but now they were a tool without a purpose. Voices within the party's political leadership began to grow that if the SA's violence could not be channeled and controlled, then they should be removed from the equation. While all of these discussions and political maneuverings continued, the violence continued as well, and tens of thousands of individuals were arrested by the SA and held in makeshift prisons and camps, and that's not including those held in the more formalized concentration camps and prisons. At its core, the SA was about violence, and that violence still found an outlet, even if suddenly the political side of the party no longer wanted it to continue. The second problem that the SA was causing for the Nazi political leaders was due to Rome's view of what space the SA should occupy within German society. Rome wanted to turn the SA into the official state military, with it continuing to be structured like a revolutionary militia. The SA leadership saw the army as a threat, and so if they were going to launch this second revolution, one of the targets of that revolution would be the existing German military, with the expectation that they would fight to maintain their position within society. Rome was not daunted by this, and in February, he would present his plans for the SA to the new cabinet. The SA, the SS, and all veterans groups would be combined into a single new People's Army under the new Ministry of the Defense, with the obvious implication that Rome would be in control of that ministry. Hitler, joined by all of the other Nazi political leaders, believed that it was essential that instead of removing the army, the support for the army should be carefully cultivated. Hitler would never be shaken from this view during 1933 or 1934, and so removing the Reichswehr was never a serious possibility. Hitler was adamant that the SA as a state militia was never going to happen, and he would openly reject it at a meeting of the Reichswehr, at the Reichswehr ministry on February 28, 1934. Even with Hitler clearly rejecting Rome's plan, the SA leader would never completely give up on it. 
At that meeting on February 28th, Rome would allegedly say, quote, What the ridiculous corporal declared doesn't apply to us. Hitler has no loyalty and has, at least, to be sent on leave. If not with, then we'll manage the thing without Hitler. End quote. I say allegedly here because this seems a little too convenient for Rome to be overheard saying this um, at this point. This meeting would not be the end of the discussion, and into March, Hitler and Rome would still be at odds about the future of the SA. Rome's inability to move past this concept, which he obviously believed was the best path forward, forced Hitler into a position where he would eventually have to choose either between the SA and the army. Hitler believed that while the SA had played a pivotal role in bringing him to power, he also believed that it was essential that the SA learn to follow the directions of the party's leadership, and that meant supporting the army. With Rome unwilling to alter his views, and Hitler believing that they were a growing threat to a continuation of Nazi power, the final confrontation between the two would grow closer and closer during the spring of 1934. For their part, the Reichswehr was alarmed and concerned about the hopes of the SA to replace them. Many military leaders saw the SA as no more than a destabilizing force within society, and certainly not one capable of creating a military force to defend Germany. However, there was a complicating factor in all of this, and that was the fact that everybody knew that Hindenburg was reaching the end of his life. The aging field marshal had been president for almost a decade, and among Nazi leaders, there was a concern that the army and navy would support a return of the monarchy after he died. This was obviously not part of Hitler's plans, and so he began discussions with military leaders to assure that when Hindenburg passed away, they would give their support for Hitler and his position as Chancellor, and most importantly, they would support the position of Chancellor absorbing many of the powers previously held by the President. This would kick off a series of discussions that we will discuss in more detail in later episodes when discussing the German military's relationship with Hitler. But for now, it is enough to say that the military leadership agreed to Hitler's plans. This would in effect make the dictatorship a permanent feature of Germany. As part of these discussions, and as part of Hitler's attempts to ensure the loyalty of the army leaders to the continuation of his power, he promised to once and for all remove the SA as a threat to the traditional German military. Then he also guaranteed that the army and navy would continue to be the sole defensive institutions in Germany. During the early summer months of 1934, it was clear that the SA problem would have to be solved quickly. The SA had taken over various buildings to serve as prisons for people they found to be enemies of the state. Many communists, socialists, and Jews were included on that list. These people had been kidnapped, taken into these buildings, and then tortured, starved, and then mostly just left to die. Rumors of what was happening inside these prisons would reach the police and other government officials, and which eventually prompted action. From Goering's Ministry of the Interior came an order to start closing down the SA prisons that had been opened up over the previous year. Attempts to complete this action would prove to be a perfect example of the rift that had developed between the SA and the rest of the Nazi regime. Several SA commanders who were in charge of these prisons, even when presented with written authorization from the Ministry of the Interior and Goering, demanded that they be provided with an order directly from Rome. When officials then entered the makeshift prisons, what they found inside was ghastly. Many victims were simply beyond assistance. Others would never fully recover, either mentally or physically. The calls for definitive and effective action from Hitler to contain the SA would only continue to mount. In early June, Hitler would meet with Rome for nearly five hours late into the night. He would claim at this meeting that he had made it clear what he expected Rome to do. However, we do not have an account of this meeting from Rome's perspective, with any personal notes from this period having been destroyed, and any close associates that Rome may have spoken with being executed. What we do know is that Rome did kind of tone down his pressure on the Nazi government during the month of June, but he did not completely change his tune. The Minister of Defense, General Bomberg, would make it very clear to Hitler that he had to take action in the very near future if he wanted to ensure continued peace within Germany. He would then discuss the situation with the president, with the understanding that if the government did not get a handle on the situation, the president would declare martial law, which would put the military in control. This seems to have been the moment that lit a fire under Hitler and prompted him into action. He was more than prepared to move against the SA if it meant continuing good relations with the army. Even though the military was pushing strongly for an action though, believing that actions against them was imminent, there is no firm evidence that Rome or anybody else in the SA was seriously planning the second revolution at this point, or, at, or any real direct action against the army. 
Again, information is fuzzy on the interior workings of the SA and the thoughts of SA leaders at this time, but if there was firm evidence of this planning and these preparations, that seems like something the Nazi leaders would have held onto and, and would have published. Even though the SA was a high priority for the government, it was not the only thing that the Nazi leaders were trying to get a handle on during June 1934. For example, Hitler would meet with Mussolini in Venice on June 14th. However, during the last week of June, the situation began to develop rapidly. On June 25th, the commander of the Reichswehr put the army into readiness. All leaves were cancelled, all troops were recalled to barracks. But even after this order was given, it does not appear that the final date and time for any action against the SA was decided on until perhaps as late as June 28th. It was only on that date that orders were sent out from Goering and Heinrich Himmler to ready the SS and elements of the Goering-controlled police. By this time, word was getting out that something was happening, and the SA had learned that there was something that the Nazi leaders were going to do to bring them under greater control in some way. This caused the SA to react exactly as you might expect, doing what they did best, which was take to the streets. In Munich, up to 3,000 SA men would move through the city, shouting things like, quote, the Führer is against us, the Reichswehr is against us, SA on the streets. These demonstrations would continue all through the night. Hitler was on his way to Munich anyway, for the purpose of meeting with the SA leaders, and their meeting was scheduled for midday on the 30th. But instead of waiting, he decided to move against them immediately after he arrived in the city. Hitler and his entourage of SS and police would gather up some more police and move directly to the Hotel Hanselbauer, where Rome and other SA leaders were staying. They would enter Rome's room and declare that he was under arrest. Rome would be just one of many SA leaders that were arrested at this time. Just a few hours later, Hitler would speak to both party and SA officials that were gathered to hear his speech. Apparently, Hitler was visibly furious during this speech, almost to the point of uncontrollable rage. He would fire away at Rome and the other SA leaders, saying that they were plotting against him and against the party and against Germany. He declared that they would be punished as an example to everybody else, and that they would be executed. Interestingly, at least initially, Rome was not one of the SA leaders who was to be executed with Hitler apparently planning to spare him on the basis of his long and distinguished service to the Nazi cause. However, other Nazi leaders, especially Himmler and Goering, who felt most threatened by Rome and the SA, put pressure on Hitler to make an example out of him. One item I did want to mention, and, and that gets mentioned in some histories, especially older histories, is the subject of Rome's homosexuality, which was kind of an open secret among Nazi and SA leaders. Apparently, when this topic was discussed in front of Hitler by other SA members, Hitler made it clear that Rome's sexual orientation was a private matter, and he did not feel that it in any way altered his capabilities as a leader. What this seems to make clear is that for all the reasons that Hitler had Rome arrested and later executed, his homosexuality was not among them. Only on July 1st would Hitler agree to have Rome killed, although he was given the option of suicide. When Rome was given a pistol in his prison cell, he refused to use it, instead requesting that Hitler come and kill him personally, but this was not going to happen, and so he was shot and killed. Rome was not the only person executed as part of the action against the SA, although the number is challenging to ascertain. On July 13th, Hitler would claim that it was only 61 people, but there would be a list published by German emigres in Paris that listed 116, but also claimed that there were over 400. And then at the trial in Munich in 1957 that kind of discussed these matters, the number was put at over a thousand. As with many events at this time, it's very hard to track down exactly what happened. It would be so long, and after so many calamitous events, that an investigation would even begin. General Schleicher, who we of course discussed in some detail a few episodes ago, would be shot and killed at his house outside Berlin. Gregor Strasser was arrested in Berlin and then killed in prison, apparently on the personal order of Goering. As these two examples make clear, not all the people who were executed in the first days of July were in any way associated with the SA. Instead, it was used simply as a way of clearing the books a bit for the Nazi leaders, removing anyone who knew too much of past events or who had crossed the party in the past. The SA was put under new leadership, with Victor Lutz taking over for Rome. Now, Lutz was an SA leader from before the Purge who just so happened to be the one who had been feeding information to the Nazi leaders which contributed to their decision to move against Rome, which is awfully convenient. 
The essay would also begin a rapid reduction in total size, with membership reduced to almost half within a year. The German public knew uh, about what had happened. Hitler would even speak about it in front of the Reichstag later in the month. Many believed that the government had successfully removed a violent threat to Germany and had moved to protect the German people. Obviously, the fact that the SA was a violent group created by the Nazi party was downplayed as much as possible. Hindenburg would send Hitler a message saying that he felt gratitude for Hitler's resolute intervention and that he had rescued the German people from serious danger. International reaction was more mixed. There was concern about such state-sponsored violence, especially where it spilled out beyond the SA leadership. While the essay had become so problematic for the Nazi leaders in the year before the Night of the Long Knives, it had still been a useful tool, and so the position that the essay had occupied was filled with a new organization. Days after the night was over, it would be announced that the SS was now fully independent of the SA, and it would quickly begin to expand its number of members, eventually becoming far more powerful than the SA had ever been. However, the Nazi leaders sought to fix what they saw as the SA's greatest weakness, its disloyalty, and it was made clear to members of the SS that their only loyalty was to Adolf Hitler, and they would swear an oath to affirm it. The reduction of the SA to the point of impotence marked an important turning point for the Nazi regime. It represented a final and firm break from all of its talk of revolution before 1933, and it made it clear that the Nazi leadership was in it for the long haul. They still had many changes planned for Germany, but they would all be done incrementally and with at least a nod to some kind of legality most of the time, although they of course cared very little for the actual legality of their actions. Next episode will be a pretty big shift in topic for the podcast as we discuss the economic policies of the new regime as it tried to bring Germany out of the Great Depression after 1933.